Hey everybody, welcome back to a new video. I'm really excited to show you guys the Pecron E1500 LFP today. Now instead of just being a budget power station like in the past, this model has been fully upgraded to have a lot of premium features that I know you guys are looking for. For example, the E1500 is compatible with Pecron's new expansion battery. This is the EP3000. This is a 48 volt lithium iron phosphate battery and it's rated for 3,072 watt hours of capacity. You can connect two of those to this and get up to 7,680 watt hours of capacity. And check out this adapter cable, guys. It uses 90 degree connectors, meaning it's gonna take up a lot less space when you connect these to the actual power station. The AC charging has been upgraded on the E1500. This supports internal fast wall charging up to 1400 watts. Gone are the days where you have to carry around a humongous charging brick. This is the charging brick for my Pecron E2000, and I hated bringing this with me. Well, now you only have to bring one cable to charge this via AC input. The Pecron has also added smart app connectivity to the E1500, so you can actually connect to this with your smartphone, you can control it remotely, and you can upgrade the firmware if there's any other new features they want to add to this. So I'll be breaking down the smart app a little later in the video. Now the E1500 also has a huge solar charge controller. You can get 700 watts on this port and 100 watts on that port for a total of 800 watts charging via solar panels. Now some of the other features include a wireless charging pad on the top, this has a 30 amp DC output that supports up to 400 watts through these connections. This also has UPS functionality with a fast cutover time that we'll be testing later in the video. Now for the actual inverter, it has a 2200 watt pure sine wave inverter rated at 120 volts. So we'll have to see how good the power output is, but that's large enough to power a full size fridge, a microwave, or even power tools outside if you wanna do some work with this portable power station. So lots of really, really cool things about the E1500. Now this is called the E1500 LFP because it has 1536 watt hours of capacity using lithium iron phosphate batteries inside rated at 3500 charge cycles till 80% of the original capacity. Now this is listed on their website at $12.99 as the actual price. It is currently on pre-sale for the next week or so for $899. And I do have a 5% off discount code that Pecron has included for my viewers that I'll include down in the video description. So you can take an additional 5% off that $899 price. Now, hopefully you guys can see me behind these three power stations on the table. I just wanted to show you guys some of the differences. So over here we have the E600 LFP. Right here we have the E2000 LFP and we have the new E1500 LFP. Oh, it's hard to remember all those numbers. Okay, so the main differences between these three models, the battery voltages. So the E2000 and the E600 have 24 volt lithium iron phosphate batteries. The new E1500 has a 48 volt lithium iron phosphate battery. So the expansion batteries for both these models are not compatible with each other. You have to purchase the new EP3000 48 volt expansion battery if you want it to be compatible with this. Well, now that we know all the features for the new E1500, how does it actually perform? Well, in the rest of the video, I'm gonna be doing extensive testing on the AC inverter, the DC output, and charging demos to make sure this behaves as advertised. So the first thing you wanna do is jump into testing the AC inverter. If you look here, you have three outlets that you can plug your appliances into. This is rated at 2200 watts, and it's supposed to be a pure sine wave. So let's see how it actually performs. The Pecron E1500 inverter packs enough power to keep your full-size home appliances running during a power outage. Powering up a microwave can be extremely beneficial if you need to cook food or boil water quickly. The microwave here in my basement is rated for 1000 watts output, and when running the microwave off the E1500 inverter, it pulled around 1600 watts of power and functioned without an issue. In the next test, I wanted to see how long the E1500 could run my full-size basement refrigerator. Keeping your food from spoiling during a power outage can save you hundreds of dollars. Starting at 100% state of charge, the fridge was pulling a little over 100 watts while running, and checking in 15 hours later, the power station was at 1% state of charge, so a pretty decent runtime on a medium-sized battery. Just remember, you could easily extend this runtime by charging with solar panels or purchasing compatible expansion batteries. 
Now, what about powering large tools around the yard? I wanted to see if the E1500 could power my 10 inch compound sliding binder saw, as this requires quite a bit of surge capacity to start up the motor. When cutting through multiple wood two by fours, the inverter handled the surge load really well, and this inverter should be able to handle other power tools that require a similar amount of power or less. Now that we know the E1500 inverter can run tools and appliances, let's see the quality of the power that the inverter puts out. By pushing the inverter to the maximum output for 15 minutes, we can see if it holds the full rated wattage without overheating or experiencing voltage drop. Once I enabled the inverter and connected my max load, it was pulling right over the 2200 watt limit. After the test had been going for a few minutes, I checked the output with my oscilloscope. It was a decent sine wave at 60 hertz with just a little bit of distortion. And using my voltmeter, I could see it was sitting at a steady 119 volts output, so no voltage drop from the inverter. After letting the test go for almost 10 minutes, the power station fans had kicked up to their highest speed. And when testing the loudness of these fans, I was getting around 53 decibels at three feet away. And here's a demo of what the fans sounded like. I also wanted to see how well the power station fans were dissipating heat and using my thermal camera to take multiple pictures, you can see the max temperature I measured during the test was 122 degrees Fahrenheit with other temperatures around 100 degrees or less. This shows the fans work well to keep the power station cool. Within the next couple of minutes, my stopwatch hit the 15 minute mark and the Pecron passed the max load test. Now, how many watts will the Pecron inverter allow you to pull before it actually shuts down? I continued to raise the load on the power station inverter until it hit 2,493 watts. And at this level, the inverter finally shut down, displaying an overload error on the screen. Now that's a full 20 amps of power at 120 volts. The E1500 also has the ability to act as an uninterrupted power supply or UPS. This means that when you have the power station plugged into a wall outlet, it bypasses the internal battery and puts power straight out to your devices. When it senses the grid power going down, the power station automatically swaps over from wall power to using the batteries inside. This is advertised to happen within 9 to 20 milliseconds on the E1500. I tested the UPS functionality with my desktop workstation, a 24 inch LED monitor, and my studio lights all running off the power station inverter. I simulated six different power outages by unplugging the power station from the wall while running the load. Six out of six times the PC and monitor were still running after it was unplugged. With these impressive results, it appears the Pecron UPS mode is fast enough to support sensitive electronics as the power goes out. Now, some of my viewers power sensitive electronics like ham radio equipment or portable speakers on their power stations. And for that reason, I like to test for noise or interference that the power station may create. Using my dirty electricity meter, the EMI reading was over 2000 millivolts of noise while connected to the inverter. And with a reading that high, you'll hear an audible buzz on the inverter. To confirm this, I plugged my guitar amp in and there's definitely noise on the inverter. I also wanted to test what type of interference I would hear on a small handheld AM radio. This is the first time I have tested this, so let's see what happens. With the AC inverter enabled, this is what it sounded like. I also wanted to do a similar test with the DC output enabled, so these are what those results sounded like. Because of this noise from both the AC inverter and the DC output, I'd recommend keeping your radio equipment at least a few feet away from the power station to avoid that interference. It was interesting to see these results and I'll continue to test this on other models in the future. The final results that I completed on the Pecron power station were for both the AC capacity and AC idle results. The internal battery is rated for 1536 watt hours of capacity and when draining the power station at a 0.2C rate via the AC inverter, I was able to pull 1310 watt hours of capacity. And this result of 1310 watt hours is 85.2% of the advertised capacity. These results were right on par since my goal is to hit at least 85% of the rated capacity when discharging a power station. Now, how much power is used as the AC inverter is enabled and sitting idle? I started with the power station at 100% state of charge and left the inverter enabled for 13 hours with no load. And when I came back, it was sitting at 70% state of charge, meaning the inverter had used 30% of the battery over 13 hours, or about 2.3% per hour. Now, most power stations average around 1.5 to 2% per hour, but since this power station has a large inverter and a smaller battery, it's a little power hungry at idle. Well, now that we've finished testing the AC inverter, let's break down a few of the results. 
First off, we were almost able to pull 2,500 watts from the inverter before it shut down from being overloaded. So very good there. It did have a pure sine wave output and we did get a full 120 volts from the inverter even under peak load. Now for the actual UPS, the transition times were very quick. Out of the six tests that we did on the PC, all six times the PC kept running. Now what about usable capacity? As we discharged this all the way down, we were able to get 85% of the advertised capacity, which is a little bit over 1300 watt hours. So good results there. Because this is so lightweight and portable, it only weighs 40 pounds, most people are gonna be able to move this around and power what they need to. Now one really cool use case for this is to take this camping, a really good advantage of that is having a very large DC output to power 12 volt fridges, diesel heaters, electric blankets, CPAPs, lights, whatever you want, this is gonna be able to power it via 12 volts. So in the next part of the video, I wanna break down the testing I did on the DC output. So let's go ahead and see those results. The first thing I checked on the Pecron E1500 was to see if the DC output was regulated. This means the DC voltage stays the same even while draining down the power station. When I plugged my battery tester in, it was showing 13.3 volts, and this power station also shows the internal battery voltage on the display, which was showing 52.5 volts at its current state of charge. So the 12 volt output is indeed regulated. You won't have issues running 12 volt devices even when the power station is near 0%. In the next test, I tried to pull as much power as possible from each of the available 12 volt outputs. Connecting my load tester to the 5525 barrel port first, I went all the way up to 180 watts. This is a crazy amount of power for a 5525 barrel port, so I'd recommend staying under 85 watts since they get quite warm above that wattage. When connecting a 12 volt cigarette plug, I was able to pull an impressive 190 watts, and that's only because that's the limit of my battery load tester. In the next test, I connected a small 12 volt inverter to the XT60 port, which is rated for 30 amps. I successfully pulled 250 watts powering a small electric heater, and there was still room to go higher before I hit the full 30 amp limit. So I tried to pull the maximum power from all DC ports at the same time, which ended up being right around 400 watts. Super impressive DC output. I absolutely love this feature. You could run a bit of different devices off these connections. Now, Pecron includes this really cool adapter cable in the box. It has these alligator clamps and a 30 amp inline fuse, and it's designed to connect up to the 30 amp XT60 connection. And if you remember, this DC output is regulated at 13.3 volts. Now, Pecron support says this is designed to connect up to an external battery to boost the voltage. Now, this won't fully charge a battery, but if you have a pretty empty battery, it will get it up to a usable voltage. Now I've gone ahead and connected the alligator clamps to my main negative and main positive of this DIY battery. Let's see how fast it's charging. So I have it connected up and you can see on the screen we're charging at 52 watts. So it is actually charging the battery. Now keep in mind this 100 amp hour battery is fairly charged right now. So we're not seeing a ton of power coming from this port. But if this battery was dead or if you had a starter battery for your vehicle that was dead, you'd get much more power going into the battery. This is a pretty cool feature. I then moved on to testing all six USB ports on the front of the power station. The E1500 supports one 100 watt USB-C power delivery port and one 18 watt power delivery port. There are also four additional USB-A ports that support 18 watts each. When connecting two USB-C cables at the same time, I was able to charge my Energizer 320 successfully at 100 watts but my EcoFlow River 2 was only able to charge at 10 watts. I verified with multiple cables and power stations that I could only get 10 watts from that 18 watt USB-C port. Pecoron Support did test a few units in their warehouse and they successfully charged at 18 watts, so this must be an issue with only my unit. Another interesting note, if you connect a USB-A device to the port below the 100 watt USB-C port, by design, the power will be reduced down to 10 watts. This change is in place to protect the USB microcontroller that powers both these ports. You can use the other three USB-A ports without an issue and still get the full 100 watts output. The E1500 also supports wireless charging on the top of the power station. The charging pad is rated for 15 watts, and when I put my smartphone on the top, it successfully started to wirelessly charge. Some power stations I've tested on the channel will automatically shut off the DC output only after a few minutes if the load isn't consistent. So if you're trying to run a small fan, a CPAP, or even a 12 volt fridge overnight, this can be a problem. Luckily, Pecron has a setting within their smart app to keep the outputs from shutting down automatically. In order to test that setting out, I plugged in my new Iceco VL35 Pro 12 volt fridge into the 12 volt cigarette port 
and configured the fridge set point to 36 degrees. I came back after 24 hours and the DC output was still powered on and the battery had only dropped down to 73%, meaning that you'd get a really long runtime if you were to go camping and powering a 12 volt fridge and you wouldn't have any auto shutoff settings with the DC output. The final tests that I completed on the DC output were the capacity and idle power usage tests. The E1500 is advertised to have 1536 watt hours of capacity and while draining the power station completely down via the 12 volt socket, I was able to pull a total of 1446 watt hours over an 11 hour time period. These results were an impressive 94.1% of the advertised capacity, which is well above average compared to other power stations I usually test. In the next test, I like to see how much power the DC output uses while sitting idle while left on for a long period of time. I call this the DC idle test. I started the test at 100% state of charge on the power station and checking in 10 hours later, it was at 97% state of charge, meaning the DC output is very efficient and only uses 0.3% per hour while sitting enabled with no load. Now this is a pretty big deal because this is a 30 amp DC output, yet it's still very efficient. Well guys, breaking down the results of the DC testing, very impressive results. 94% of the advertised capacity, I think it was around 1,446 watt hours. That is really, really good. Pecoron always does a really good job on their DC capacity tests. Also, my favorite thing about this power station has got to be this 30 amp output. I love that Pecoron added that on here because that's just so useful for people that go camping like I do. This is a portable device. I think it's, it would work great for camping and having that 30 amps to plug in multiple devices at the same time is really cool. So in the next section of the video, I want to break down the charging options for the E1500. There are three charging ports, so let's break down the specifications for each one. Now you have all your charging ports on the left side of the power station, starting with your DC input. The smaller port is a 5521 barrel connection. Now this is designed for a 100 watt panel. It supports 12 volts up to 18 volts, and it does mention in the owner's manual it has a VOC cutoff of 25 volts. So you want to make sure you do not go over 25 volts on this port here. Now, if you want to charge faster, they have an aviation style port here. Now this supports 32 volts up to 95 volts. So you will have to have panels in series on this one, but you do not want to go over 95 volts open circuit. Now this one charges much faster. It supports up to 700 watts versus the 100 watts on this smaller port. Now down here, you have your AC input. Now they've changed a lot with this. There are no longer any external charging bricks. All you have to do is plug this into the wall and this will charge at up to 1400 watts. So pretty cool that it has much faster internal charging. It's nice that Pecron includes so many different charging cables in the box. Starting with the first one, this is a 12 volt cigarette plug with the 5521 barrel connection so you can charge in your vehicle while driving. The next one is actually an adapter. This is the aviation style port with an Anderson power pole so you can connect up to the aviation style port with whatever type of battery that you want. The next one is an actual MC4 solar charging cable, so the aviation port to MC4 cables. And then remember, there are no external charging bricks, so you just plug this AC charging cable into the wall or a gas generator and you can charge it up. And the last cable here is actually not for charging the power station, but it allows you to connect to the 30 amp DC output and charge an external battery up to 13.3 volts. So it kind of gives you a chance to boost one of your batteries if you have a battery that's dead. So pretty cool, I thought I'd talk about this cable. It's not necessarily for charging the power station, but these ones are. So now I wanna go ahead and do some charging demos and I've started with a 12 volt battery using the 12 volt cigarette plug to 5521 barrel connection to simulate what happens if you would charge in your car. So on the screen, you can see we're getting 98 to 99 watts charging input. So it'll take around 15 hours to charge this power station using a 12 volt battery. Well, what about using 24 volts? Do we get any more power using a 12 to 24 volt converter on the 5521 barrel connection? Well, looking at the screen, you can see we're still getting 99 to 98 watts charging input. So not much of an advantage. Looks like this port is definitely limited to 100 watts. So whether you use a solar panel or a battery, you're gonna get 100 watts on that 5521 charging port. Now check this out guys, I didn't think this would work, but I have my 24 volt boost converter plugged into the aviation style connection and we're getting 260 watts charging input. Now remember this said it had a requirement of at least 32 volts, but it charges with 24 volts. So pretty cool that you can use a boost converter plugged into this port here and get a lot of power. Now the fastest way to charge the Pecoron E1500 is by using the AC charging cable. 
It's rated to charge up to 1400 watts. So let's go ahead and connect the cable and see what happens. So with the cable connected, you can see we're charging slightly under 1400 watts. So we are getting the advertised charging speed. Now this is so much faster than the older charging bricks that these power stations used to use. I really like this upgrade with the internal fast charging. Now once the power station hits 80%, just like it did, you'll see the charging wattage drop down from 1400 down to around 800 to 850 watts, and it's an automatic change. You cannot make it charge 1400 watts above 80%. Now I also wanted to test charging the E1500 off my 48 volt server rack battery. So I have this connected up to the positive and negative terminals of this battery using a fuse connection. And it's plugged into the aviation style port here. And we're getting almost 700 watts charging input off this 48 volt battery. So anybody that's curious, that is 52.79 volts at 13.8 amps coming from this EG4 battery into the E1500. Now I've gone ahead and discharged the power station down so we can test dual charging with AC input and high DC input. What happens when we plug in both charging sources? Do we get a lot of charging? Does it prioritize solar or does it prioritize AC input? So I'm going to go ahead and connect the 48 volt battery here to the DC input. So we have both of them connected at the same time. Let's give it a minute and see what happens to the charging input. So you can see now we're seeing an increased charging amount. And I think this is going to drop down. Okay, so it's going to level out around 1400 watts, but what charging amount are we getting from each input? Are we getting a priority to solar or are we getting a priority to the AC charging? So looking at the 48 volt battery, we are charging at 12.9 amps and 52 volts. So we are getting around 700 watts from the 48 volt battery. And then the AC charging is filling in the rest. So that's awesome to see that we get a priority to solar input and then it fills in the rest with AC charging. So peak charging amount is going to average around 1400 watts and you can plug in high solar and AC charging at the same time. Now once the power station hits 80% state of charge, it does drop down the charging speed from 1400 watts down to around 800 to 850 to put less stress on the battery as it tops it off. Now, even though the charging speed has dropped down significantly, we still are getting priority to DC input. You can see we're getting 14 amps charging and then about 100 watts is coming from AC charging. Really cool to see the priority to DC charging on this power station. Now, in the next portion of the video, I want to see if the E1500 can handle charging and discharging at the same time, or in other words, pass through charging. So I have the USB ports enabled powering this small fan. Off the DC output, I'm powering this small inverter and this heater. And then I have this 500 watt heater running off the built-in inverter, all while charging off AC power. So taking a closer look at the screen, you can see we're charging at around 666 watts. And we have around 461 watts going out through the AC inverter. So we are charging and discharging on the power station. Now I wanted to see how much power was being pulled from the wall while charging. And using this inline watt meter, you can see we're getting around 1,369 watts into the power station. So with that 1,300 watts coming into the power station, you can use the screen here to determine that we are running each one of these loads and also charging the power station at the same time. So the Pecron E1500 does support true pass-through charging. The last charging demo that I want to do on the E1500 is to see how well it performs with a larger solar array. So first, I'm going to discharge it just a little bit. Then we'll take it outside and connect it up to the panels to see how well it performs. So for the solar testing today, I want to use this newly built array. Now there are five 200 watt panels here, but that would be too high a voltage. So I'm going to use four of these panels in series. These are 200 watt flexible panels from Renogy. Now for the actual solar conditions today, it's around 85 degrees. We have just a little bit of haze, not many clouds at all. So we'll see how much power we can get on the E1500. Now I have the E1500 sitting behind the solar array in the shade. Now we are slightly over paneling this power station and I have the wire plugged right into the main charging port. Now with the solar panel connected up, we are getting 567 watts charging input. The battery is sitting at 73% state of charge and it is estimating 0.7 hours until this is full. And if you push the DC button, you can see the internal battery voltage sitting at 54.4 volts. So there you go guys, connecting solar panels to the E1500. What would you expect in real world conditions? Well, these panels aren't angled perfectly and we do have a little bit of haze today, but almost 600 watts charging input, not that bad. 
Now, another test that I wanted to add to this power station review is to make sure that you can have solar panels connected to the power station 24 seven. Some power stations will have a charging relay that clicks on and off whenever the voltage gets too low. So at dusk and dawn, you'll hear a very annoying clicking noise going back and forth until there's enough sun to keep it on. So I plugged in panels to this power station 24 seven. Overnight, there's no issue at all, but in the morning, when the sun started to go up, I did not hear any clicking. So this power station definitely allows you to have panels connected 24 seven, and there's no annoying clicking relay that goes on and off. Now, one exciting upgrade that they've added to this model of Pecron is smart app connectivity. So they have this smart app that you can download and connect to the device. You can see I've connected to Wi-Fi here so I can control this remotely. And I want to break down some of the features of the smart app. Now, once you're connected to the device in the smart app, you can see the state of charge at the top and it gives you an estimated time for charging or discharging right below that. Now for output, you can toggle on and off both of these outputs. So the AC and DC output, it's nice to be able to control that remotely. It also breaks down what's happening here. For the input, you can see what's coming in on DC and AC as well, which is really cool. For the battery pack details, this will break down the voltage and the amperage going in and out of the battery and also the temperature. And you can also see expansion packs here if you happen to have them attached. Alarm records, this will tell you if you've overloaded something and it'll alert you to that. You can actually see the device owner's manual. This is a really cool feature to have the whole entire owner's manual inside the smart app so you don't have to carry that around. You have some basic input and output settings. So you can change the voltage slightly, the hertz slightly, and this is the auto shut off for all the outputs. So if you want this to auto shut off, you can set to one hour, uh, two hour, three hour, four hour. I have it set to off so it doesn't have any auto shut off settings. And you also have some basic system settings here where you can change the name of the device. You can also unbind it in the app. You can change the screen brightness and this is so the screen turns on and off uh, the brightness. So I have that turned off for the video. Now, the last thing here, if you want to update the firmware, you have to come down to the bottom, the me area and click settings, and then you have your device update options. So if there's any firmware updates for a device that you have, you'll see that in here, and then you can update the firmware. So overall, I'm very happy with this smart app. It's very easy to use and it actually works really well. Now, whenever I do a power station review, I think it's important to talk about the product warranty and the customer support for the company. Now, what does Pecron offer for a warranty on this product? Well, it has a one year warranty out of the box and they give you the option to register it on their website for an additional year. So you can get a two year warranty if you register the product on their website. Now for actual customer support, you can email support at pecron.com. You can also go on their website and click on the chat icon to chat with them, or you can click on the submit a form and kind of fill out a contact form to get a hold of them as well. Now, out of all the videos that I put out on my channel about Pecron products, I've gotten pretty good feedback about their customer support. Now, of course, you're gonna have some issues here and there, but overall, I do feel Pecron does a good job trying to take care of their customers. I also had a chance to connect the new EP3000 expansion battery to the E1500 using the included connector cable. I like this more slim design since it takes up less space than other options that I've tested. Connecting the battery to the power station is simple. Just confirm the state of charge is within 10% of each other. Turn off both units, connect the cable, and once the units are connected, you can turn them on and they will sync up. You can view this in the smart app and it'll display the information for each battery. The battery is rated for 51.2 volts nominal with 60 amp hours of capacity or 3072 watt hours. While the battery was connected to the power station, I was able to do a full AC capacity test. While discharging the entire setup at a 0.2C rate down to 0%, I was able to pull a total of 4,210 watt hours. This result was 91% of the advertised capacity, so we actually got quite a boost in efficiency using the expansion battery versus the power station alone. The Pecron EP3000 expansion battery can completely function on its own. Let's do some basic tests on it. The expansion battery has a dedicated DC output featuring a 100 watt USB-C port and an 18 watt USB-A port. It also has an XT60 connection rated at 30 amps output, which is pretty cool. When testing these ports, I was able to use both USB ports at the same time, powering a small USB fan and charging my Energizer 320 at 88 watts. I also tested the 30 amp DC output by using two battery load testers connected at the same time. I was pulling 14 amps on each connection for a total of 172 watts and 180 watts respectively. That is a ton of power available from this port. The EP3000 also has a built-in 400 watt MPPT charge controller. It supports 12 to 95 volts input up to 15 amps. 
I was able to test the EP3000 with my portable solar array in the late afternoon. Using my inline watt meter, I was able to hit the 400 watt charging limit of the charge controller. I like having these extra connections and solar input on the EP3000 battery. It's much better than other brands that don't have any connections on their expansion batteries. Well, congratulations for making it this far in the video. We have covered so much information about the E1500 and the expansion battery. So right now I wanna go ahead and take the power station and put it through my power station grading system. Now, about a month ago, I announced that I was gonna be putting out a new version of the grading system. And I asked for your guys' feedback and you guys gave me so many different ideas. So I appreciate your guys' feedback. So I'm excited to announce the power station grading system 2.0. Now I'll probably break down all the details of this system in a future live stream, but let's go ahead and see how this one did on the new system. So here's the power station grading system 2.0. There are 20 requirements in order for the power station to get a full 10 points. Each one's worth a half point. If you look on here, they need to score well in many different categories. And these are the things that my viewers are looking for. So let's see how the PEC run actually did. Now throwing up the results, you can see that it does not have a three year warranty. It does not have adjustable charging speed and it did have noise on the AC inverter. So it got a total score of 8.5 points out of 10 points available. And the final grade is a B. Well, a super respectable score for the E1500. Now the bar has been raised, so we'll have to see what new power stations can meet that new bar. Now I will tell you, I'll go back and try to edit the existing spreadsheet with the new uh, kind of requirements. It's gonna take a while to do that, but it'll be interesting to see how the score jumps around on those power stations. Now, if you guys like this video, please give me a thumbs up. Please give me feedback or your thoughts about the Pecron E1500. I think Pecron has done an outstanding job with the upgrades on this, especially versus the previous generations of Pecron devices. Lots of really cool things about this. Let me know what you guys think about the Pecron E1500 down in the comment section. Now, if you guys like this type of content, I invite you guys to subscribe to the channel. I have a lot of really cool projects coming out and we'll see you guys in the next video.